okay, so this recording is going to cover the first part of chapter 13. And chapter 13 deals with brain and the cranial nerves. And the first thing we need to do is to uh, learn the parts of the brain. So when we think of the brain, we actually think of the uh, cerebrum, the biggest part of the brain. That's typically what most of us are going to picture when we think of the brain. So this pink area right here is the uh, cerebrum, which is the biggest part of the brain right there. But notice that uh, hiding within the cerebrum, it's another structure right here that looks like a bird. That's the diencephalon. Below the diencephalon is the midbrain, which is also called the mesencephalon. Below the mesencephalon is this uh, little bump there, which is called the pons. Below the pons is the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is the most inferior part of the brain, which joins with the spinal cord below. Posterior and inferior to the cerebrum is the, the cerebellum, which is this structure right here. Notice that the midbrain, pons and medulla together make up what we call the brain stem. So you should be able to identify the parts of the brain from a picture or recognize a description of each of these parts of the brain. So that's the first order of business. Again, remember that the, the structures that make up the brain stem are the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. So in this picture, what's colored in green is the, mid, is the brain stem. The purple area here is the diencephalon. The cere uh, cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. Uh, cerebellum is inferior and posterior to the cerebrum. Okay, next are the structures that protect the brain. And we're gonna focus on the meninges. So the brain is protected by the skull, which is bone. Below the skull are layers of connective tissue called meninges, which are going to be very similar to the meninges of the spinal cord. Uh, the the uh, brain is uh, protected uh, outside, inside and out by a, uh, uh, this, the cerebrospinal fluid by water, a watery uh, fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. The blood-brain barrier is another form of protection. If you remember from last chapter, the blood-brain barrier was created by the astrocytes, which would, this were a, a population of glial cells that had access to blood vessels and to axons of neurons. So substances that wanted to reach the central nervous system from the blood would have to travel into the astrocyte and then from the astrocyte into the axon. So the astrocytes essentially controlled which substances could reach the neurons. So that's what we call the blood-brain barrier. So we're going to focus on the meninges of the brain. And the layers of meninges are going to be the same as those that we found in the spinal cord. We're going to have three layers, dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. Below the arachnoid mater, mater, we're going to have the subarachnoid space filled with cerebrospinal fluid. However, there are um, substantial differences between the organization of the meninges of the brain and those of the spinal cord. So we'll start with the dura mater, uh, which is the outermost meninges and is a, a very strong, tough layer. Uh, in the brain, the dura mater is divided into two portions, the periosteal dura mater and the meningeal dura mater. In some areas, these two layers are going to separate and they're going to uh, create a space where veins are going to run. This space is called, these are called the dural sinuses. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is a cut through the uh, skull reaching the brain, that's the scalp. This will be the periosteum, which is the layer of membrane that covers bone. So this is the bone right here. Now take a look at this layer right here. 
This is the periosteal dura mater. And the layer below is the meningeal dura mater. So the two layers of dura mater are adjacent to each other. But in some places, the two layers separate, as you can see right here, to create what we call the dural sinuses. So this will be dural sinuses. The dural sinus depicted in this picture has a name. It's called the superior sagittal sinus. And this is an area where blood vessels are going to, veins to be more precise, are going to be found. So there's a, a, a large veins run through this area right there. Okay, the next, Oh, the other difference between the dura mater of the uh, brain and the dura mater of the spinal cord is that the dura mater of the brain is going to position itself, it's going to fold and position itself within fissures, as you can see right there. Uh, these are going to be called the dural folds. And there are three of these dural folds which help to separate structures in the brain. So this dural fold right here is running through the longitudinal fissure that separates the two cerebral hemispheres, the right and the left hemispheres. That particular dural fold is called the fold cerebri right there. Let me show you where the other dural folds are located. So we have the, so the fold cerebri running on the longitudinal fissure, which separates the right and the left hemispheres, right and left. Um, another fold is going to run through the transverse fissure right there, which is a fissure found between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. That dural fold is called the tentorium cerebelli. The third dural fold is found in between the two cerebellar hemispheres. So this is the cerebellum, and the cerebellum could be divided into a left and a right portion. There is a dural fold that runs between the separation between the two cerebellar hemispheres. That dural fold is called the fold cerebellum. So you should know, uh, be able to recognize a, a picture of the dural folds in lab. In lecture, it will be a description of the dural folds. This is the fold cerebra right here running through the longitudinal fissure. You can see here the sinus. This would be the superior sagittal sinus right there. So that's the blood vessel that runs through that sinus. There's another sinus down here, another vein running through that sinus. Here's another sinus right there. Okay. So the sinuses were places where the periosteal and meningeal dura mater separated to make room for these veins to travel in between them. Okay, so we're talking about the fold. So there is the fold cerebri. The, the uh, tentorium cerebelli will be this fold right here. So the cerebrum will be located in this space. The cerebellum will be located in this lower space. And the tentorium cerebelli runs through this uh, transverse fissure that separates those two uh, uh, structures. The third uh, the third um, dural fold is the fold cerebelli. You can see it right here, runs in between the two cerebellar hemispheres. So this picture is from an actual specimen, and you can see how the fold cerebra right here is the fold that is found in between the two uh, cerebral hemispheres. This is the one uh, hemisphere will be in this space, the other hemisphere will be in this space. Both hemispheres are connected by structures below the fold cerebra, and you can see here the, the uh, foramen magnum uh, through which the uh, spinal cord will exit. The tentorium cerebelli will be this area right here. So below this area will be the uh, cerebellum. This is from another specimen. You can see the two cerebral hemispheres are still there. This is the false cerebri separating them. Uh, the tentorium cerebella is in this direction right there going inward. And this is the false cerebelli which has been removed. The cerebellum would have been in this area, so these folds will fold in this manner, and they've been they've been uh, opened up. Okay. Now let's go back to the meninges themselves, and we said that we had the uh, periosteal meningeal duramater, the meningeal duramater, 
Below the meningeal dura mater is the second dura mater, the, the second meninges, which is their arachnoid mater right there. So this is the same organization we would find in the uh, um, in the uh, spinal cord, in the meninges of the spinal cord. The, um, now, there is another small difference here. Between the meningeal dura mater and the arachnoid dura mater, there's a small space called the subdural space right there. Okay. In the spinal cord, we didn't have a subdural space. These two meninges were adjacent to each other. The, um, below the arachnoid mater is another space called the subarachnoid space, and cerebral spinal fluid is found in the subarachnoid space. Um, and then the last of the meninges is the pia mater, which you can see right here is this blue membrane that is physically adjacent to the cerebrum, and it follows the outfoldings and infoldings of the cerebrum. Um, there is one more difference, one more thing to note between this, the cerebral uh, meninges and the spinal meninges. And this is going back to the arachnoid mater. You can see the arachnoid mater right there. And notice that it creates these structures right here, which go into the dural sinuses. The structures are called the arachnoid villi. I right hear the arachnoid villus. And the function of the arachnoid villus is to drain CSF. So cerebrospinal fluid is constantly being made, and there it constantly has to be drained, otherwise it would accumulate. So cerebrospinal fluid travels through the subarachnoid space, goes through the arachnoid villi, and is going to be drained in the sinuses. OK, so you should be able to identify the uh, meninges of the brain and identify the, uh, the differences between the meninges of the brain and the meninges of the spinal cord. Now, the uh, cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid that bathes the brain on the outside and on the inside. So all of the central nervous system was developed from a hollow tube, which means that the inside of the brain has a spaces inside. Those spaces are called ventricles. The space inside the spinal cord is called the central canal. Through Within these spaces, CSF is made and it circulates. So the, the location where CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, is made is within the, the ventricles of the brain. The, the structure that makes CSF is called the choroid plexus. So we're going to look at these ventricles and their location. There are two large ventricles within each of the cerebral hemisphere. These are called the lateral ventricles. And you can see here the right lateral ventricle, and here's the left lateral ventricle. The lateral ventricles do not communicate with each other. However, both of them communicate via an interventricular foramen with the third ventricle, which is located right where the diencephalon is located. From the third ventricle leads the cerebral aqueduct that lead to the fourth ventricle. And the fourth ventricle leads to the central canal in the spinal cord. So from a lateral view, this is the lateral ventricles right here. You can see there the interventricular foramen that leads to the third ventricle. You can see the cerebral aqueduct that leads to the fourth ventricle, and the fourth ventricle lead to the central canal. So you should be able to identify the ventricles um, in the lab using a picture. Um, right there is the lateral ventricle, interventricular foramen, third ventricle, which is located in the diencephalon. And notice that it has the shape of the diencephalon. Then comes the aqueduct, which leads to the uh, fourth ventricle, which is leading to the central canal of the spinal cord. Now, CSF itself, it comes from blood. So it's very similar to plasma. It is mostly water. Uh, circulates and bathes the brain and the spinal cord inside and out. So it's going to circulate inside in the ventricles, outside in the subarachnoid space. 
The volume is constant, meaning that it's constantly being made and is constantly being drained through the arachnoid villi. Uh, it provides cushioning and buoyancy to the brain, protects the brain, and then also brings nutrients and chemicals and removes waste from the brain. Remember, we mentioned that the choroid plexus is the, the, the structure that makes CSF. Uh, the choroid plexus uh, consists of a blood vessel, you can see right here, a capillary. Adjacent to the capillary are the glial cells that make CSF, which are called ependymal cells. So in this area where the choroid plexuses are located in the ventricles, um, these areas, these are one of the areas where there is no blood-brain barrier available. If there was a blood-brain barrier, there would be no access to the blood. There's another depiction of the choroid plexus. And remember that CSF is a filtrate from blood, so it's going to be mostly water. It will contain nutrients like glucose and vitamins, oxygen, ions. Uh, however, the CSF will not have large proteins or red blood cells or white blood cells. Now, CSF is constantly being made at the choroid plexus of the ventricles. So you can see here this red squiggly line is the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle. This is another squiggly line, which is the choroid plexus of the third ventricle. And here's another squiggly line, the, the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. So you should have an idea of the circulation of CSF through the uh, ventricles and then reaching the subarachnoid space and draining from the subarachnoid space through the arachnoid villi into the sinus. So if we uh, start in the lateral ventricle and look at what would happen to the CSF that is made in the lateral ventricle, that CSF will exit the lateral ventricle through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. From there, the CSF will reach the cerebral aqueduct, which will take the CSF to the fourth ventricle. In the fourth ventricle, CSF is going to drain into either the sub, uh, subarachnoid space when it exits via the lateral apertures. At this point, the CSF is now in the subarachnoid space and it can circulate in the subarachnoid space until it reaches areas where the arachnoid villa is located and there it will be drained into the sinuses. Another, um, another route is the CSF going down through the medial aperture into the central canal of the spinal cord. At the end of the spinal cord at the conus medullaris, CSF can exit and begin traveling through the subarachnoid space, which will eventually lead it to the um, area where the, uh, the arachnoid villa is located and the CSF will drain into the uh, into the uh, sciences, so you should have an idea of the uh, of the circulation of CSF in the brain. Now going back to the blood-brain barrier, we said the choroid plexus was one of the areas that lack blood-brain barrier. You should know the other two. The hypothalamus lacks a blood-brain barrier in the areas where it is monitoring the chemical composition of blood. So the, the hypothalamus monitors blood for oxygen concentration, CO2 concentration, pH, glucose levels, etc. In those areas, there is no choroid plexus, otherwise the hypothalamus would not have access to the blood. The other area other than the choroid plexus, where the blood-brain barrier is absent, are the areas of the brain that secrete hormones. And those are the hypothalamus, again, pituitary gland, and pineal gland. So you should definitely know the three areas that lack a blood-brain barrier. Again, reviewing the parts of the brain, this is an actual specimen. You can see the cerebrum up here. This right here is part of the cerebrum also. So all these will be cerebrum. 
the location of the lateral ventricle is right here. And notice that there is a membrane called the septum pellucidum. You should know that for lab. This is the corpus callosum, which is an area that connects the two cerebral hemispheres. This is uh, white matter. This is the septum pellucidum. And behind the septum pellucidum is, the, is one of the lateral ventricles. So there's, you know, there's two septum pellucidums, one from one side, one for the other side. All right, so below, this is, again, cerebrum. Below the cerebrum right here, this is the diencephalon uh, with the epithalamus on top. This is the top part of the uh, diencephalon is the epithalamus. The thalamus is going to be the center right here. And then the hypothalamus will be below right there. Okay, so all these, these are the three parts of the diencephalon, the epithalamus, thalamus, and hypothalamus. Below the diencephalon is this small area right here, which is the midbrain or mesencephalon. Below it is the pons, and below it is the medulla oblongata. You can also see on this side the cerebellum. So again, just emphasizing you need to know the uh, parts of the brain. You can see here the um, brain stem, which consists of the midbrain or mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla. You can see the, uh, now this is the septum pellucidum has been removed from this specimen, and you can see the lateral ventricle inside. The third ventricle will be located in the diencephalon, and from there you can see the aqueduct here, which leads to the fourth ventricle. Okay. Uh, remember that the brain stem consists of the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. And there's the cerebellum to one connected right there and right here uh, to the pons. Now, the next PowerPoint is a summary of, um, of the brain uh, and the functions of the different parts of the brain. So in that regard, it is a very, it's a very useful PowerPoint because it's summarizing the information on the next uh, uh, PowerPoints. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the parts of the brain, and we're going to start with the top, the biggest part, the cerebrum. The cerebrum is divided into two hemispheres, a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere, separated by a longitudinal fissure. And remember that the full cerebri was the location where the uh, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the longitudinal fissure is the location for the where the fault cerebri was located. Um, the uh, surface of the cerebrum is convoluted. It has uh, outward uh, folds called gyra, and then inward folds which are called sulci. There are also deep fissures that separate different structures. So you have here a um, depiction of the surface of this of the cerebrum, and you can see the outward folds or gyra, and then the infoldings right here, which are called sulci. Okay. I'm um, also notice that the uh, outermost surface of the cerebrum is made of gray matter. This is called the cortex of the cerebrum. So you can see here these. A small area of gray matter is called the cortex. Remember that gray matter houses the bodies of neurons. So you can imagine in this tiny, tiny area, millions of neurons cluster together and their axles coming in and out from their bodies into the white matter. Uh, the other thing to note is that this, the uh, cerebral cortex is divided into lobes and the names of the lobes correspond to the bones in that area. So this will be the frontal lobe, parietal lobes, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. The occipital lobe, sorry, the frontal lobe and parietal and temporal can be separated to view an internal lobe called the insula. <clears throat> Notice this deep involution right here in the middle that is separating the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. This sulcus is, this sulci is called the central sulcus. 
The uh, gyra behind the central sulcus is the postcentral gyrus. The gyrus in front of the central sulcus is the precentral gyrus. Um, yeah, remember the transverse fissure, which separated the cerebrum from the cerebellum, and that was the place where the tinctorium cerebelli was found, the dural fold. Okay. Now, another uh, fact about the uh, cerebral hemispheres is that uh, they are uh, lateralized, that they have a specific functions or somewhat specific functions. So the left function, the left, the left side, the left hemisphere appears to be more in control of analytical thought, logic, language. So oftentimes language centers are only found on the left hand side science, math, etc. Whereas the right hemisphere is more spatial, creative, um, holistic thought type of uh, side. Now, something else about the uh, hemispheres is that they correspond the, or they control or receive information from the contralateral part of the body. So the left side is receiving information from receptors on the right side of the body the left side received, sorry, the right hemisphere receives sensory information from the right side of the body. Similarly, when it comes to motor commands, motor commands that are going to the right side of the body originate on the left hemisphere. Motor commands going into the left side of the body originate on the right, right hemisphere. So the motor and sensory pathways are going to crisscross. Uh, that crisscross we actually call the accusation. So the fibers are going to decusate from one side to the other at one point or another of the brain. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the cerebral cortex and we're going to start with the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. Now the motor areas are going to control the uh, voluntary movements of a skeletal muscle. So this is going to be all somatic motor control. So it's somatic motor control because it's going to innervate a skeletal muscle. So um, the, um, the cerebral cortex, and again, what, what we're doing is we're looking at the areas on the superficial, the surface of the cerebrum and their functions. So in the, uh, in the uh, um, information um, in the cerebral cortex is highly organized so that the motor areas are all located on, in front of the central sulcus. So it's all going to be motor areas. The sensory areas are going to be behind the central sulcus and in other lobes. So this is a, a good organization, a very specific organization. So motor and sensory are not mixed. They are uh, concentrated, the motor ones on the front, sensory on the back, and the temporal lobes. So we're going to add motor areas. We're going to look at uh, sensory areas, the areas that receive sensory information. And then we're going to have the more complex areas, which are going to be called association areas, which integrate information from uh, different sensory areas, uh, from the uh, limbic system, the emotional brain, is going to have access to stored information, to memory, and it's going to be able to, through integration, interpret sensory information and put together a response. So these are the more involved areas of the brain, the association areas. Okay. So as far as motor areas, we have three motor areas that we're actually four motor areas we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the primary somatic motor cortex. Notice that here we have the word somatic, which meant body, and we have motor, which means movement. So that means that this area are issuing commands that are going to go to a skeletal muscle. So, so these are going to be somatic motor neurons going to a skeletal muscle. Um, and so for the premotor cortex also, even though it doesn't have the word somatic and motor in it, the premotor cortex is 
also going to serve a uh, skeletal muscle. And the same is true of the Broca's area and the frontal eye field. So these entire motor areas are all involved in somatic motor uh, movement and skeletal muscle control. So the primary somatic motor cortex is located on the precentral gyrus, right in front of the uh, central sulcus. Okay. Now, the function of the area, the function of the prim primary motor co cortex is to put together conscious control of precise, skilled, voluntary movements. So writing, for example, or threading a needle um, will involve precise, skilled, voluntary movements, which are coming from the primary cortex, of, which is located in the precentral gyrus. Um, the cells located in that area are huge cells called the pyramidal cells, which are going to, uh, their axons are going to travel directly from the cerebral cortex all the way down into the spinal cord. So these can be very, very long uh, tracks, very long axons. This from it right here is a motor homunculus and is a representation of the primary motor cortex. Uh, the primary motor cortex is located in the precentral gyrus. And this is what they have done. They figure out the uh, location, what parts of the primary motor cortex control which parts of the body. And so they drew that part of the body next to the, to the, to the area of the cortex that controls the movement of those areas. And then they did something else. They drew these parts of the body big or small, depending on the number of neurons dedicated to that part of the body. So you can see here that the little homunculus has huge hands, indicating that there are millions of neurons, motor neurons, dedicated to the control of the skeletal muscles in the hands. No surprise there, because remember, these primary uh, motor cortex, uh, the, the primary somatic motor cortex, is going to put together precise skill motor movements. The hands are capable of many precise skill motor movements. So no surprise that the hand is big. Uh, in contrast, take a look at the arm, tiny. The trunk, tiny. Legs, tiny. Uh, feet, tiny. There really isn't much precise skill motor movement coming from those parts of the body. Okay. So there aren't very many neurons in charge of those areas. On the other hand, take a look at the face, huge face that encompasses a large area of the uh, precentral gyrus, indicating again lots of neurons in charge of that area. No surprise there because of facial expressions, for example, which require a lot of precise motor movement. Uh, the uh, tongue has its own little place right there. Again, that's not surprising. So that's what the motor homunculus represents. So moving on, the area in front of the primary motor cortex is the, the premotor cortex, right here. The premotor cortex puts together learned repetitive types of movements. Just a second, I lost that part, oh, there we go. So it is located anterior to the precentral gyrus and puts together uh, learned repetitious types of uh, patterned types of motor movements. So it is um, in these kinds of movements that involve planning um, or sequential, uh, running, walking, riding a bike, all these learned types of movements are put together from the prim uh, premotor cortex. In front of the premotor cortex is the frontal eye field right here and the Broca center right there okay these areas the Broca center is a language motor area and what this does is it is going to uh, be in charge of uh, innervating the muscles that are involved in a speech so the muscles of the tongue of the throat um, respiratory muscles for that matter too um, what else 
the, the, the diaphragm, I should say, not respiratory muscles, but one of them at least, the diaphragm, which you know, we also is involved in speech. Um, well, okay, any other muscle that's involved in the speech. Um, so it directs muscles of the tongue or any other muscle involved in the speech. So this is where uh, the motor speech center is located. Oh, another point is usually on the left um, because the language area is on the left hemisphere. The um, next, the uh, uh, other area, the frontal eye field, which is immediately in front of the, pre of the premotor cortex, is uh, in charge of moving the extraocular eye muscles. Uh, those are going to be the muscles that move the eyeball. And you should know those from the uh, skeletal muscle chapter. And these are going to come back, so don't forget them. Um, those will be the superior rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus, inferior oblique, and superior oblique. So these are very, very important muscles that they have their own little part of the uh, uh, cerebral cortex that are in charge of their movement. Again, that tells you how many neurons are involved in moving those muscles, those tiny little muscles, um, meaning that these muscles are, are capable of very precise and intricate type of movements. So you should know the areas, the motor areas of the cerebral cortex and their function, the general function of each. So now we can turn to the sensory areas. And the sensory areas are actually highly organized. Um, we have an area for general senses. So this will be the area where general senses are going to arrive. General senses will be anything that is sensed by the skin or by joints and muscles. So pain, um, pressure, uh, touch, uh, pressure alone has many different types of receptors. Uh, what else? Temperature, etc. So that general sense information is going to arrive at a primary somatosensory cortex, which is located in the postcentral gyrus. The, this is the area that receives the information and has an, um, and gives us the location from where this information is coming from. So if somebody's touching you on the back, the primary somatosensory cortex would let you know somebody's touching you in the back. Now, the somatosensory association area is going to interpret the information that arrives from the primary somatosensory cortex. Uh, here, the key word is association, meaning that this area is going to be, uh, is, will be able to get information from other parts of the brain and will be able to interpret what is coming in from into the cortex, into the primary somatosensory cortex. So for example, you feel something touching you on your back. The somatic, uh, the somatosensory association cortex will, cortex will let you know that it is a feather touching you in the back uh, or a brick, for example. So you'll be able to interpret uh, the uh, more details of the information arriving at the somatosensory cortex. So again, the key terms here is primary and cortex. That's the place where the information arrives. And the other key word is association, which is the area that interprets. So if you look here at the uh, brain, uh, this was the central sulcus right here. The motor areas we just talked about are right there in red. In the post-central gyrus here in purple, that is the primary somatosensory cortex, where uh, general sensation arrives. The somatosensory association cortex is all of this area right there. Okay, so this is all in the parietal lobe. Okay, so following the same pattern, we're going to have a primary visual cortex. So primary visual cortex, again, primary and cortex. Let's you know, this is where the visual information arrives. This cortex, this primary visual cortex is located in the occipital lobe. Adjacent to the primary visual cortex, there will be a uh, visual association area also located in the occipital lobe. 
So this is the occipital lobe right here. This will be the primary visual cortex. So this is where visual information arrives and you get an image, okay? The uh, prim visual association area is going to interpret that image. So you'll know that the image is that of a chair. It's made of wood. It's colored red, etc. So that takes care of the visual area. And this lets you know how important vision is because the entirety of the occipital lobe is dedicated just to vision. Uh, let's go for the auditory area. The auditory, the primary auditory cortex is located in the per lobe and adjacent to it, also in the parietal lobe, would be the auditory association area. So if you look at the picture, the uh, auditory cortex is right here, the superior aspect of the temporal lobe, and adjacent to it will be the association area. So that's the, that's, sorry, that's uh, auditory right here, hearing, okay? Right there. So you should know vision is in the occipital lobe, hearing is in the temporal lobe. Uh, we have two left, uh, olfaction and taste. Now, olfaction. Primary olfactory cortex is also in the temporal lobe. I'll show you where. The association area is extremely complex. The olfactory association area is located as part of the limbic system, among other areas. So it's more than one area. The limbic system is the emotional brain, which means the olfactory information is linked to the emotional brain, uh, which also means because the emotional brain, the limbic system is in charge of storing information uh, for long-term storage, processing information for long-term storage, olfactory information can be, and oftentimes is, processed for permanent storage. So we can remember smells, and smells are going to elicit emotions. And if you don't believe it, just uh, know that there are entire industries that do believe it and invest in uh, perfumes and all kinds of smells that are going to pick up our emotions. So that is the association, olfactory association area. The, gust the gustatory cortex, gust gustatory cortex will be the taste. It's also loca it's, uh, located between the temporal lobe and the insula. Uh, that's where the primary cortex is located and the association areas. Let me show you, actually, I have a better PowerPoint for these. Give me a second, they're right here. So this PowerPoint here is showing you the gustatory, uh, actually this is the olfactory cortex right here, the primary olfactory cortex right there in the uh, temporal lobe. And the gustatory cortex right here is between the temporal lobe and the insula. Okay, let me see if we left anything out. We got auditory cortex. And we had the um, uh, olfaction and uh, gustatory cortex. Okay, if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt. Okay, so now we're going to look at the limbic system. And uh, the limbic system is the emotional brain, and it is located in several areas. This is a highly complex system, so this is an association area. Um, there are uh, the, the function, you need to know the function of the limbic system, uh, provides uh, interpretation and uh, emotions. Um, it helps establish memory, so information is going to be processed for, for permanent storage in the limbic system. Uh, creates emotional states, uh, states, is also the site of motivation. The areas of the limbic system are located in the cerebrum and the diencephalon. Okay. Uh, the limbic system interacts with the prefrontal cortex, the front, the frontal most part of the of the uh, brain, which is the area that uh, is consciousness, is is the, the thought, the uh, intellectual area. And so that by the limbic system being in connection with this area, uh, we're going to become aware of our emotions and we'll be able to react to them properly, hopefully, and understand emotions. 
Areas of the limbic system are going to be the olfactory cortex, the primary olfactory cortex is part of the limbic system. The fornix, which is an area of the cerebrum that is going to process olfactory information. Uh, and then in the diencephalon, the hypothalamus is part of the limbic system. It is involved in memory, it involves in drives like sexual drive, hunger, thirst. Other areas of the limbic system will be the singular gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus, and the amygdala. And now in this PowerPoint, this is a parasagittal view of the brain. And you can see here, um, uh, this is the corpus callosum here. You learned that in lab right there. And so above the corpus callosum is a gyra called the cingulate gyrus, which is part of the um, limbic system. Also, this is the primary olfactory cortex. This is the parahippocampal gyrus right there. Okay. Okay. So the next area of this of the cortex of the cerebral cortex. Oh, you know something? I did forget something. Give me just a second. I'm gonna come back really quick before we leave this. This um, I just remember something that I I did not cover right there. Um, just really quick. Uh, this is the sensory homunculus. This is the equivalent of the motor homunculus that we saw earlier. And the sensory homunculus is again a map of this of the uh, 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 the uh, primary somatosensory cortex located in the postcentral gyrus. And the uh, size of the part of the body represents how many neurons are involved in receiving information, in this case, sensory information from those areas of the body. So lots of information coming in from the hands. No surprise, you know, the uh, it's, you know, the sensation in the hands is very important. Uh, then we have very small a limbs, very small trunk, because there isn't much sensory information coming from there. Now take a look at the foot though. The foot in the motor homuncula was very small. Here is very large. So there's a lot of sensory information coming from the soles of the feet, which again, no surprise there. The genitalia has its own area. Uh, we have a, a pretty big uh, head right there. Uh, lots of information coming from the lips, actually the uh, gums and the teeth have their own area, the tongue has its own area, the throat has its own area, as so do some of the intra-abdominal organs. So just uh, to uh, uh, remember to understand what a sensory homunculus is. Okay, so let me go back. And um, the last part of the cerebral cortex that we're going to talk about are the multimodal association areas. And the multimodal association areas are highly complex areas. There are three of them. We've already talked about one. We talked about the limbic association area. The other two are the anterior association area and or the prefrontal cortex and the posterior association area. Out of the two, the prefrontal cortex is the most complex. Uh, prefrontal co uh, cortex is involved in intellectual uh, behavior, uh, cognition, recall, personality. This is the working memory, the one that can uh, access uh, uh, memory. It can, uh, has conscience, judgment, reasoning, persistence, etc. Uh, notice that development of area depends on feedback from social environment. So we develop the prefrontal cortex by interacting with people. So this is the prefrontal cortex right here in pink. It's a huge area of the brain, probably of the cerebrum. So one of the most developed or the most developed involved of, uh, of the cerebral cortex areas. The other one was the posterior um, association area, which is this one right here. The other name of this area is the Wernicke's area. Uh, the Wernicke's area, these are multimodal association area. The Wernicke's area is in charge of a speech. It's going to understand written speech, speech, spoken language, uh, sign language, anything that has to do with the speech will be interpreted by the, uh, this uh, posterior multimodal association area, also called the Wernicke's area. 
So notice that the area that interprets the speech is in one part of the brain, the part of the air, the uh, uh, part of the area that the area of the brain that actually produces the speech is in a different area. So our ability to uh, is speak a language is separate from our ability to understand a language. Okay. And unless we can connect these two, we will not be able to speak and understand a language. So you probably know people who can understand a language but cannot speak it. And the reason why we that is possible is because the two areas are separated from each other. OK, so that takes care of uh, the first set of PowerPoints. Any questions? OK, we do have a few minutes. Go ahead and at least get started with the second set. We may not be able to finish it, but I want to go ahead and at least get started. OK, so uh, what is still working with the um, kind of just kind of skipped. Yeah, we're still working working with the uh, cerebrum. So now we're going to look at other areas of the cerebrum. Um, we're going to look at the cerebral white matter. All of the areas that we've been dealing with up until now are going to be the areas at the cortex, this little, little area right here at the surface, which has gray matter. Uh, this is an area that is loaded with uh, bodies of neurons, and their axons are going to travel out to other areas, creating what we call the white matter of the uh, cerebrum. So white matter will be axons of neurons. Uh, notice that there are areas where these axons cross over to the other hemisphere. Uh, these fibers that are able to cross over from one side, one hemisphere to another, are uh, creating what we call, are, are what we call commissural fibers. So commissural fibers are fibers that can travel, and fibers means axons, that can travel from one hemisphere to the other, to the other hemisphere. Uh, notice that some of these fibers just connect areas of the cerebrum that are adjacent to each other within the same hemisphere. Those are going to be called association fibers. And then there will be fibers that come out of one hemisphere and head toward different parts of the brain. Those would be called projection fibers. So let me show you the different types of fibers. We'll have commissural fibers, which uh, and the corpus callosum is an example of, of a place where there are commissural fibers. And these uh, is going to these fibers are going to connect gray matters of both hemispheres. Association fibers connect parts of the same hemisphere. Projection fibers, uh, like the corona radiata connect the hemispheres with the lower brain or spinal cord. So let me show you the picture of these fibers down here. So the ones in red will be association fibers. The one in green here is the commissural fibers. And the ones in blue are uh, projection fibers. OK. Um, the last part of the cerebrum that we're going to deal with are going to be an area of gray matter located deep in the cerebrum. These, remember that internal gray matter areas were in the CNS, in the cerebrum actually, were called uh, nuclei. Sometimes they're called ganglia, but we don't like to do that because it's because ganglia is what we name the gray matter of the PNS, so we want to. We don't want to use the same term for uh, CNS and PNS. So we're going to stick to nuclei in the in the uh, CNS, in the in the brain specifically, and ganglia in the PNS. So these are areas where we find bodies of neurons. Okay, there's one specific ganglia that's very important. It's called the basal ganglia, and it is located in the caudate nucleus in the lentiform nucleus, which in turn is formed by two other, the p and the globus pallidus. Uh, let me show you location of these areas. So this is the caudate nuclei right here. Uh, this is the corpus callosum. This is the lateral uh, ventricle. This is the third ventricle. This thing in purple is the, um, the uh, diencephalon. Uh, and so the, uh, the caudate nucleus is right here. 
the lentiform nucleus with the putamen and the globus pallidum is right here to the side below the caudari nucleus. Uh, what these areas do, the basal nuclei, is involved in uh, control of the skeletal muscles. Um, it's going to help regulate attention and cognition. Uh, it's going to regulate the intensity of a slow or stereotypical movements. So for example, if you're going to pick up a glass of water, that may be a movement that is dictated by the premotor cortex in the cerebrum. But before that movement is put together, it is going to be sent, the plans for the movement will be sent to the basal nuclei. The basal nuclei is going to modify and clean out the plants so that only the necessary muscles are going to be contracted, are going to be used. All the other muscles could be, would be inhibited. So it's going to eliminate a slow, unnecessary or stereotype movements so that the, once the movement is, uh, is edited by the basal nuclei, it is performed perfectly. The best way to know how something works is to break it. And then we really understand what happens or what the function of that, of that structure is. When the basal nucleus is not functioning properly, we have a condition called Parkinson's disease. So what Parkinson's disease uh, uh, causes is a suppression of the basal nucleus. So now we don't have the, any, any type of regulation on the intensity of the movements. Uh, there's no inhibition of antagonistic or unnecessary movements. So the, per, the uh, patient with Parkinson's that is going to pick up a glass of water is going to be shaking and it will be difficult for the movement to be done uh, efficiently. Okay. Uh, there's also going to be attention and cognition deficit in Parkinson's. Uh, now, as far as the uh, basal nuclei, we mentioned the parts of the basal nuclei that are located in the cerebrum. There is also another part of the basal nuclei that is located in the mesencephalon. Uh, the area is called the sustentia nigra. And this is an area in the mesencephalon, so that will be uh, below the diencephalon, that is going to produce secrete a, home, a, a, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. So these neurons, the axons of the neurons in the substantia negra, are going to travel up all the way to the basal nuclei uh, of the cerebrum and innervate the nuclei and activate dopamine, the neurons of the caudari nucleus and the lentiform nucleus. If the neurons of the substantia nigra in the mesencephalon stop functioning, stop secreting dopamine, that is when the patient or the person gets Parkinson's. Okay. Um, we have a couple of minutes. What I'd like to do is I'm going to go ahead and keep going until the hypothalamus, and then I will stop at the hypothalamus. So we have covered the cerebrum. Now we're going to go to the next portion below the cerebrum, which is called the diencephalon. Diencephalon has three parts, the thalamus in the middle, epithalamus above the thalamus, hypothalamus below the thalamus. So thalamus in the middle, epithalamus above, hypothalamus below. Uh, this is also the location of the third ventricle. So there is a uh, this area right here in purple is the diencephalon. The, ep the epithalamus is up here on top. This round purple area is the thalamus, and this deeper purple down here will be the hypothalamus. Now, the function of the thalamus, I'm going to go here, is uh, is is described as the final relay station for sensory information. Um, it is a large area. It is, comprises most of the diencephalon. So what is happening in this area is that sensory information coming from uh, the uh, inner ear, from the retina of the eye, uh, is going to travel towards the thalamus. And as it travels towards the thalamus, there is there are going to be three um, uh, three neurons that are going to three sets of neurons taking the information to its final destination 
in the cerebral cortex. So the final relay station between neuron number two and neuron number uh, three takes place in the thalamus. So if you have, let's say, a neuron carrying uh, auditory information from the inner ear, this will be neuron number one, which is going to arrive at the medulla. The neuron number one gives the information. Oops, I'm going backwards here. Oh, well, let, me, let me erase this guy. These are sensory neurons, so I should, uh, I should draw them as unipolar neurons. Okay, that's much better. Okay, so there's the little unipolar neuron, neuron number one, coming from the inner ear. And in the medulla, the information is given to neuron number two, Okay, so this is one, this is two, this is in the medulla, the first synapse. The last relay station will be in the, in the thalamus. So neuron number two reaches the thalamus and it gives the information to the last of the neurons, neuron number three. So this is the last relay station in the thalamus. Neuron number three is going to go all the way to the auditory cortex. Okay. So that's why this is described as the final relay station. Um, part of that, what it's also going to do is it's going to sort, edit, and relay information, all of the sensory information, meaning that it is going to block some of the information, so that information will never make it to the cortex. Um, it is also a, a middleman between motor activities between the cerebral cortex and the basal nuclei. So it relays information between those two areas. So let me go back to the picture of the thalamus. And we're not going to be specific. What I just need you to do is I need you to know the functions of the thalamus as the final relay station. Now, there are two little uh, nuclei in the thalamus that do need to be pointed out more individually. These are called the medial geniculite and the lateral geniculite nucleus. In the medial geniculate nucleus, auditory information arrives. In the lateral geniculate nuclei, visual information arrives. And that will be the final relay station before the third neuron takes that information to the occipital cortex in the case of the vision, uh, visual information, or the temporal lobe, uh, cortex of the lobe, the auditory cortex, uh, in the case of auditory information. Okay. Uh, these other nuclei are receiving general senses information, and it will be relaying it to the primary somatosensory cortex. So just know the basic uh, function of the, of the thalamus, and, uh, and that's really the most important part. Okay, hypothalamus. Located below the thalamus is a small area, but it's incredibly important. It has many, many, many functions. Um, it does have a couple of structures uh, that, are that are notable. It has a mammillary body that comes out of the thalamus. So here, there's the little mammillary body right there. Uh, mammillary bodies is uh, areas where reflex movements of the lips and the tongue are generated. So suckling, licking will be generated in the, from the mammillary bodies. The infundibulum is another important structure from the hypothalamus. This is a little stalk, little branch of the hypothalamus that comes down and joins with the pituitary gland, which is a gland that secretes hormones. So there is a direct connection between hypothalamus and pituitary gland. And that will be especially important next semester when we look at uh, hormones. Um, OK, now hypothalamus, it is an autonomic control center for many visceral functions. OK, so autonomic control center means that blood pressure information arrives at the hypothalamus and a response will be issued out. Heart rate, digestive tract motility. So food arrives at the stomach, then information is sent to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to process the information and return a command to begin a peristalsis of the stomach. Okay, uh, heart rate, okay, so our blood pressure goes down, that information is sent uh, to the hypothalamus, hypothalamus puts together a response to increase blood, blood rate, uh, uh, heart rate in order to increase blood pressure. 
So this is uh, autonomic function control center. Uh, this is also a center for drives. It's part of the limbic system. This is where we uh, initiate drives like uh, uh, hunger, uh, fear, rage, sexual drive, etc. Um, another function is the regulation of body temperature. We saw this in chapter one. This is uh, the thermostat of the body. Also regulates food intake, water balance, thirst, regulate sleep and awake cycles. It's one of the places that does these. Um, also the place where hormones are going to be released that control the anterior pituitary also produces the hormones secreted by the posterior pituitary. So this is an area of hormone production. Um, the other, okay, so let me go back to the hormone production right here. This is actually important because what this is telling us is that the same area that controls the secretion of hormones is also controlling autonomic function right here, which means that um, the hypothalamus is going to respond via the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that will be autonomic control centers and is going to respond by secreting hormones. So it's in control of the two communication systems of the body. That's how important the hypothalamus is. Okay. All right. So uh, definitely know the functions of the hypothalamus. It's extremely, extremely important area. Okay. And then he close by briefly speaking, uh, talking about the epithalamus. The epithalamus is the side where the pineal gland is located. The pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin, which uh, also regulates the sleep awake cycles, just like the hypothalamus does. Okay. So that is it for the diencephalon. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Uh, we have a few more, about half of the PowerPoints is still to go, which makes it perfect because then what we'll do is next time, we will uh, finish PowerPoint number two and start and finish PowerPoint number three. So we'll have covered all of uh, chapter 13. Okay. So I will uh, schedule another uh, session probably over the weekend that will wrap up chapter 13. Uh, chapter 16, I'm going to go ahead and again schedule another session probably Monday of next week. Uh, it is a fairly short chapter, so it should not take long. If I can schedule it over the weekend, I'll do that. But if not, it'll be on Monday at the latest.